I was all pumped, I got a recruiting letter when I was in eighth grade. A lot of you guys know that if you get a recruiting letter when you're eighth grade, it's just bulk mail. But at the time I was like, Bradley wants to offer me a scholarship. That's what I thought, right? And so the, I opened up the letter and was thinking it was gonna be like a handwritten offer. And it was just a quote that was typed up that they probably sent to a thousand other kids. But it said, the image of a champion is someone bent over, dripping in sweat at the point of exhaustion when no one else is watching. That was my first recruiting letter. So I was like, boom, slapped it right above my bed. And the crazy thing is, what I thought about is, if you think about it, think if you can get to, it's easy to work hard when people are pushing you. It's easy to work hard when people are watching you. Well, most players don't work hard in those, what I call unseen hours, the hours where no one's watching you. You know what I mean? Like, it's easy to cheat a rep. It's easy to go check your phone and see if anybody's texting you, tweeting you. It's easy to kind of slack off. But like those guys that like are just, like Russell Westbrook has it. He'll run those sand pits in LA and like he times himself. Like he'll start his phone right here and sprint up and come back down and press his phone so he doesn't cheat. You know what I mean? Like he'll have to go touch something and then come back to his phone to stop it. And like he doesn't want bad scores. Like that's what separates people is like they have that internal motivation and drive that they're like this rep in this workout could be the rep that separates if I make or miss that shot in the game that matters. I mean, it always does. Because at, at some point in your career when the ball stops bouncing, for all of us it's gonna stop bouncing at some point, most people would say, if you polled players, what's one regret you have? I would say that 90% of them would say, I wish I would have done a little more, or I wish I would have worked a little harder, or I wish I would have cared a little more. Something a little more would follow the last statement. For me, I have zero regrets on how hard I worked. I promise you. The one regret that I would say if I had to really lock in on one is, I wish mentally I wouldn't have put a limit on myself early on. Meaning like, I literally played Brad Beal, yes, two days ago, one-on-one, -on -one, and we played five spots to seven. I won two of the spots, Brad won three of the spots, and one of the spots he beat me seven, six. Think about that. Now, Brad Beal makes $128 million. It's like $72,000 a day. I don't make anything from playing basketball. I make money training. And I'm like, man, if I'm that close to beating him in one-on-one, -on -one, there's a couple NBA players last week that I destroyed in one-on-one. -on -one. But around my junior year in high school, I had the realization I'm not going to be an NBA player. Whereas, I'll never forget Isaiah Thomas, who I grew up with. Isaiah Thomas, and again, this reference is a little bit different, but he wanted to impress this girl, one of my best friends. And so we're sitting there freshman year in high school, we're down in Vegas at a tournament, and he tells my best friend, that's a girl, he's like, you should come with me, like you should date me, I'm, an NBA, I'm gonna be an NBA player. He's maybe 5'4 at the time. She's blown away by it, because he's flirting with her and everything like that. She comes back, and we're staying in the same hotel room, it's like my parents and their parents got like the joint rooms and stuff. And she's like, I met your friend Isaiah. Um, he said he's gonna be an NBA player. Is he that good? I said, man, he's 5'4". He's not gonna be an NBA player. Like what 5'4 player do you think's gonna be in the NBA? Then we play, 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 play. I play him against, at Washington we played against each other. And I was like, I never forget after game, I was like, bro, I can't believe like, you're gonna be an NBA player. He's like, I told you I was gonna be an NBA player. He just had a different mentality than I had. I had a mentality that like, when I was in high school, I was cocky, I was, and I single-handedly put my team on my back and won a state championship. I tore three ligaments in my ankle before my final four game, so they casted it. I casted my ankle, couldn't move it. And then I scored 25 points in my final four game and 19 points in my state championship game. Was state MVP, player of the year, all that kind of stuff. We played against a team that had four D1 players. I was the only college basketball player on my team. I mean, I don't, on paper, we'd have lost by 30. But I just willed us to win. But I had that internal belief that we were going to do it. We were supposed to lose in the, in the quarterfinal games to get to the Final Four. We played against a team that had four Division I players and one NFL player. And I had 36 points, 13 rebounds, and 13 assists. I had never in my career had over six rebounds in my life, but I had 13 that day. 
had a triple double, my only triple double in my career. But as we needed that that day. And so what I'm telling you is you have to have this up here and this here be literally almost believing stuff that's crazy. I had that when it came training. I started training my junior in high school and I told everyone that I was gonna be the best trainer in the world. I told everyone. I used to go to like the Nike Skills Academies and I was like not even working the Nike Skills Academies, I was just there to learn. And I'd be like, all these other trainers don't have anything on me. I was cocky, I was arrogant. But then eventually my results started piling up. And it was like, dang, Andrew Wiggins improved his three point percentage by seven, you know, seven percent. Dang, Joel Embiid did stuff that only Wilt Chamberlain did in his rookie season. Dang, Andrew Wiggins, rookie of the year, blah, blah, blah. Zach Levine went from 29th in the mock drafts to got drafted 13th to now averaging 20 points a game. A lot of you guys don't remember, three years ago, Zach Levine didn't, was sitting on the bench at UCLA. Now he's a star. So eventually you get those results. That's the only way you can judge a trainer. And so I think that you have to have that internal confidence and belief that like, I call it unbreakable faith, where it might bend, it might kind of crack, it might, but you never break. It just always is there that you know it's gonna happen. And eventually you kind of speak it into existence and believe it into existence if you work and put in the results to get those results happen. Yeah, so I mean, I think that that becomes what area you're in, doing your research. And then two, just going to things like this. Like for me, like, Obviously, you guys know this, the guys I named were all had one thing in common. They're all like the best player in the class, right? And so I turned down NBA players, so obviously I turned down a ton of high school players. I think that too many people prioritize what people do on their resume when the truth is you have to master the basic skills. Like, we were talking about this last night, we had a little barbecue, and like a lot of players hit me up because they see my Instagram page and they see me working with tons of NBA guys, and they see the results, but the truth is, a lot of the things that I do with them are so high level, like the nuances, like for instance, that hesitation drill I did today, it would, you guys would have got that a lot better if you had trained before with other trainers. You know what I mean? So I wouldn't focus on getting the biggest, best trainer. I would focus on like getting somebody that really believes in you, cares about you, and gets that foundation down, and then go to a couple camps and stuff like that, reach out to different trainers on the internet, and kind of figure it out, you know? That's what I would do. I just think too many people put all their emphasis on others, you know, just cause like right there, in my opinion, that was asking like, how do we get somebody to push us instead of like, how do we push ourselves? You know, I had no trainer cause I, was, I had no money. You know what I mean? So like my mom's like, oh, you need a shooting coach? Great, I'll come rebound for you. You know what I mean? If you're missing left, stop pushing it left. If you're missing it right, stop missing it short. You know what I mean? Like so-and-so, like you just figure it out. So that's what, that's what I would do. I would find a local trainer that believes in you, somebody that cares about you. Don't, learn, don't look at the resumes. You know what I mean? Because I promise you, like, the day, if I, if I got LeBron James tomorrow, the media would be like, dang, he's the best trainer in the world. He has the best player in the world. That doesn't change who I am or what I know. It just means I have one more player that's on my resume. You know what I mean? There's a lot of, my biggest mentor is my high school coach. I, in my cell phone, probably have 25 out of 30 head coaches in the NBA's numbers and I probably in the last two weeks have talked to 20 out of the last of the 30 head NBA coaches like I have dinners with Popovich and Doc Rivers and Tom Thibodeau all those guys are like friends and my number one biggest mentor is my high school coach think about that you know what I mean he's taught me more than than, than anybody else